Hello, everybody on Zoom. I got this great call here with Marie. She is on fire for Jesus, and she's going to share with you about mission work. But her and her husband, they focus on children around the world. And as of right now, they've been in 79 countries around the world reaching kids for Jesus. So make sure you stay tuned because you're this is really going to be a blessing to you to watch. Are you wanting to develop your own short-term mission teams? Or maybe you have taken teams out, but you want to go to a next level of success? Well, what we've done is we've developed this mission packet for you on steroids. It covers from A to Z. It's over 50 pages long. You can download this today, brand it to your own ministry, and modify it to your needs. All you got to do is go to the description of this YouTube video, click on the link, go to our website, and download it today. Get started in short-term missions today. Thank you for stopping by our Zoom call here. I'm with Marie. She is with Family of Faith Global Missions. Her and her husband, Lloyd, um, are missionaries, I would say, to the world. Am I correct, Marie? I mean, in many aspects, you guys are in Florida, but you do uh, mission work throughout the world. Am I correct as far as we, we do. your activities we and stuff? We've been in 79 nations over the past few years, 79 nations. We were going to nation number 80 when the pandemic hit. Wow. And so we haven't been able to travel like we want. My husband's been to Honduras this year, but we're believing for more open doors throughout the world. Meanwhile, we're taking advantage of going into all the world with the technology that's available. So praise yeah. God. And that's, uh, you know, like I shared with you before we got started, that's why I, I love your Facebook post. I love your energy for Jesus and it's just evident you love the Lord and you and your husband are just on fire for Jesus and wanting to get the gospel out. But I do know that you have a different, you know, uh, uh, you know, obviously you're reaching uh, men, women and children, but your focus is kids. And you posted something here uh, the other day that I thought was really awesome. Um, I kind of stole it and put it on my Facebook, too. So um, you said something that is very powerful. And the reason why uh, I like uh, what you're doing is because my wife is passionate for kids as well. You said 86% are born again before 15. And then you said 10% uh, is 15 to 30 and then 4% after uh, 30. So those statistics uh, don't lie. And mm -hmm. it, it stresses the importance of children's ministry and, and how powerful it is. And then I put on my Facebook how I did give my life to Jesus Christ at 14 and then, you know, got my driver's license, became 16 and became a wild child until I was 22. But what drew me back to Jesus was the Lord through the Holy Spirit showed me the joy in my heart when I was 14 years old and serving the Lord. So, um, you know, if you don't mind, share a little bit about your ministry, you know, as far as what you guys are doing for kids. Yeah, so we're excited to reach that, what we call the 4 to 14 window, uh, the age where we believe they're uh, young enough. We look in Isaiah and it talks about to whom shall I teach knowledge, to whom shall I make the word of the Lord known? And it says, even to those that are weaned from the mother. And, you know, in that culture, that was probably in a three, four-year-old age. And we found that you can lead a young child in the simplicity of the gospel. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And so we do focus on that 4 to 14 age group worldwide wide. Um, what we do is children's crusades. If you've seen the big, massive gospel crusades, like a Billy awesome. Graham crusader, those kind of things, we're not quite that big yet, but we, we do those kinds of outdoor events and events in churches. We also work a lot with orphans um, all over the world because we believe that those are the kids that God's going to raise up to do even more. And of course, school assemblies in reaching the lost. Uh, and then the most important new thing I love that we're doing is the school of evangelism for children. Man. And that enables us to mobilize kids to share the faith uh, with others as well. That is really incredible, you know, because obviously it, it just it's it's evident you're thinking it through. You know, you're thinking of all the tools that need to be put in place and then how to to, like you said, just show them even how to even share Jesus with those around them. Um, and obviously they are the the coming church. You know, they are the next generation of the church. So obviously, why would you not reach these kids? And, uh, you know, I've gone in villages here locally 
And, you know, you're just thinking, hey, I'm in a nation where you can even go in a government building and they got praise and worship music going. They got scriptures on the wall. You know, everybody knows about Jesus in this nation. And shocking, I can take you five miles into the mountains and there will be people that will say, I have never heard of Jesus. So, yeah. you know, why not reach them while they're young? And then obviously the statistics, you know, is massive at that age group. Now, you, well, you go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to add to that. You know, when I was growing up, I worked next door to it. I worked a, as a children's minister in a church in the middle of the Bible belt and the people next door to us in the apartment complex church next door had never heard of the name of Jesus. So wow. unreached 1040 window in the middle of Africa, Asia, Middle East, wherever, or right there in the Bible belt in the U S or in central and South America, where the Lord is moving. Kids still need to hear the gospel everywhere. Yeah. Amen. And you know, I'm going to, I'm going to interject this. Uh, we're, we're preparing for uh, a mission team to come in June and we're, you know, we're going to focus on uh, BBS for kids. And um, so my wife was talking to the teacher there, the pastor's wife, she's a teacher. And she was saying what they were noticing because my wife develops curriculum and then also all the crafts and everything. And she said that what's happening is parents are noticing the, the material that they're bringing home. Uh, the change in the children's attitudes and so forth. And they're actually drawing parents to come to church. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it's known ministries that reach out to children and make an impact in children's lives. Many times over, you're going to uh, affect the parents and you're going to draw the parents to the ministry as well. Now, well, you said probably, that you, you had yeah. some testimonies. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I keep interrupting you. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. Say, when we were in Africa uh, recently in the nation of Rwanda, we were ministering in a village and the kids uh, were trained to go out and lead other kids to Jesus. And they did. And instead of just the 200 kids that we had, suddenly we had 500 kids at the evening meeting. And long after we left the church there, the families, like you're talking about, they had to get a tent beside their church to expand because there was no more room for all the people coming to church with the families because the kids are getting born again. They're drawing the families to come to church as well. So. Yeah, that is so powerful. Now, uh, again, like I said, you said that uh, you wanted me to share about or talk about the children's ministry around the world and how God is moving. You know, just share with us, you know, what are you seeing God doing out there with the kids? Well, I'll tell you one example. When we were in Myanmar, uh, which is right now dealing in Asia, in the India, China area, if you know where it uh, used to be called Burma. So we were there a couple of years ago before this military coup and all that's going on there now. Uh, but they've had persecution quite a bit for many years. Uh, and the children of the orphan, excuse me, the, the orphanage that we were working at were children of the martyrs. And so their parents, for example, this one little boy, his um, father had been uh, an evangelist and he was killed uh, for the faith. And then his mother became wow. a pastor of the church. And when he was four years old, they also killed her. And that was the story of probably uh, close to 100 kids there, something like that, that their parents had been martyred for being believers. So you would think that if anybody anywhere in the world were not going to be bold believers or bold witnesses for Jesus, yeah. it'd be these kids because they've just lost their parents because of Christianity, right? But no, we came in and I'm telling you the power of God fell in that room. Uh, it's hot outside. And I'm thinking if it was just me, I'd be complaining. Where's the fans? But those kids were on their face before God for three hours. We saw the power of God move. They were seeing visions, hearing from heaven, just weeping, seeing healing, seeing just the Lord healing their brokenness. But not just that, did they get filled with the Holy Spirit and moving the gifts of the Spirit? We began to see them trained. We taught them that week how to share Jesus with their community, a community that it's yeah. very much dangerous to share Jesus in, but we were there during the, um, the water festival. So it's kind of like the 4th of July in the United States or the Cinco de Mayo festival or whatever you yeah. have in your country. And so we took the kids out into the streets and they began witnessing and there in uh, Myanmar, they have children that are um, uh, temple for lack of a better word, temple prostitutes. They become yeah. uh, servants and slaves there. And so they're nine-year-old kids that become Buddhist monks, for example. And so our kids from the orphanage there were going out witnessing, leading those kids to Jesus, leading the, the 20 and 30-year-old men that were in charge of those kids to Jesus. And, uh, you know, then one particular instance, I'll share this and then we'll go on to the next story. But this little boy I told you about, about his mom and dad that had been killed, he was um, about eight years old. And um, I was just kind of standing to the side with our translator watching what happened. He had a word of knowledge from the Lord that this lady we knocked on her door had a tumor in her stomach. Now she was a grandmother age. And here's this eight-year-old boy saying, you've got a tumor in your stomach and God wants to heal you. 
first of all, she's not even a Christian. Wow. In fact, she had come uh, from India uh, into Myanmar as a refugee. Her husband had been a Christian, but she had refused for decades to believe in Jesus because she didn't want to add him to all of her other gods uh, in India. And she said, yes, I do have a tumor in my stomach. And so she pulled back her, you know, her little outfit and the, the little boy, not me, not the missionary, not oh. the adults, the little boy lays hands on the lady. The tumor instantly disappears. And the lady begins to, uh, you know, just weep. And we, the boy leads her in the plan of salvation, presents the gospel, the whole Bible story quickly, but simply. And yeah. she becomes a Christian. She gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Her and her whole household now come to the church there at the orphanage. You know, that's the kind of life change that I'm looking for in children's ministry around the world where kids are encountering God, where they're not just being educated and entertained in children's church, but rather they're experiencing his presence, experiencing his power, and then becoming vessels that are bold witnesses to go out from there to affect their community. Yeah, I mean, that story right there is just a prime example of childlike faith, of, mm -hmm. you know, what we are all to be like, childlike faith. And, you know, we as adults, and I'm not saying it's right, it's just, you know, what we what we have done, we've conditioned our minds to come up with these preconceived ideas like, oh, I, I kind of feel like she might have a tumor. Oh, no, I don't want to say nothing. That would be kind of weird. The kid, he's just like, no, I don't care. Yeah. You know, he's got this boldness in his heart for the Lord. And, and again, just like how you share, these are kids that they, they, they know that their parents died at the hand of Christianity, you know, and, uh, and still there's a boldness inside. It's amazing the persecution that people can come under, but it, it, it's like emboldens their faith. It's like the disciples, you know, the, the persecution that they, that they came under, but it just emboldened who they were and, and, and the purpose of who they were and what they were going to do uh, for the world as far as for the kingdom of God. Just absolutely amazing to hear that story. And it, it inspires me to be more bold, you know, in my own faith. Well, I'll tell you another quick story along those lines. We were in China uh, ministering to some kids that their teachers had brought them from the, um, the village school. And of course, the teachers are risking their lives to bring the kids to an English language camp for the week because, right, we weren't doing vacation Bible school. We were doing an English language camp, which, of course, was vacation Bible school summer camp for church kids. But uh, none of these kids, when they first got there, as we were talking, had ever heard the name of Jesus. They didn't even know that there was a creator God, any of that. So we started from ground zero to present the gospel throughout the week, uh, just like you do in a vacation Bible school, you know, all the Bible stories. And by the end of the week, this little girl, um, I remember uh, I, probably seven-year-old girl, received Jesus. And uh, for the first time, her family came to pick them up at the end of the week. And I was a little nervous, you know, what are they going to call the police when they realize what we've converted their kids, you know, yeah. Jesus had reached them. And instead those families were so hungry. They all received the Lord and they took their Bibles back and are now part of the underground church. And I recently heard back from one of those kids um, that was a little bit older. He has uh, just come to the United States. He said, you know, I want to be a minister now. I left China because I heard the gospel when you guys came. And now here I am going to Bible school in the U S and going to go back as a missionary to China that's what I'm looking for. Those change lives for the long term that are willing to go be those bold witnesses in nations and, and shake the earth for Jesus. Amen. I know this isn't on our question, but it does make me want to ask this. You know, when 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 did this all occur in your heart as far as for kids? I mean, is it because you mentioned that you were involved in children's ministry in your church? Um, so when did, when did this passion in your heart uh, come come? When I was 10 years old at that Bible camp uh, in, in my, uh, my, my wonderful Baptist church and all of our missions groups that we had, I just, I was 10 years old and I just received Jesus and been baptized myself. And uh, I began to see a vision of children around the world. And I didn't know what to say at 10 years old, what that meant. But I, I saw that vision and over time, God has just led me. And, and, and even when I was uh, a 16 working in the bus ministry in the inner city in Tulsa with, with one of our wonderful pastor friends there, I, I was saying, I'm going to do kids crusades all over the world. And I'm going to do children's Man. television ministry. And I was a teenager. I didn't know what I was talking about. But God, through the years, has opened those doors. And some of those visions that I saw as yeah. a child, as a teenager, I've walked into buildings now. And I remember one, it had like this, this uh, circus-like tent ceiling over it with all these many colors and the kids were coming up and I began to weep because I saw that that's what God showed me. That's what God called me to 
as a child. And so I believe that even in my life, the story that God's grace has worked through my, you know, going the wrong direction sometimes and coming back to that call, even now, I think is just really beginning to walk into the fullness of it. We've only just Man. begun. There's, there's a hundred million boys and girls that need to be led to Jesus. Oh, and I believe. Yeah. So we're, we're getting there. Now, you know, uh, I know why I know this answer, but you know, uh, for people that are watching and maybe not, you know, fully aware of missions, why missions? Why, you know, you hear, Hey, we got enough kids in the United States that need your help. Why would you go to another country and help them? Why, why not just help the kids in Florida? You just moved to Florida. Why don't, why wouldn't you do that? You know, well, I absolutely believe in Acts 1 8. It is about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, each one of us may have a different call, a different area. For us, it's going to all the world. For some of you, it may be go across the street. However, to go across the street only and to neglect the fact that, for example, right now, our brothers and sisters in India are suffering all of this. We need to be aware of what's going on in the world so that we can be a part of God's great commission. You know, why go to the world? I don't mean this as um, we're spoiled Americans, but I'll tell you a story about a little kid in, in, uh, in Africa. I think, again, it was Rwanda when we were there. Uh, these kids were living in a, uh, for lack of a better word, a hut made out of, um, you know, uh, sheet metal and mud, the dirt floor. And all they had inside there was um, a board for a table with little, uh, you know, like two by fours. And they slept on the corner and they had a fire. And they were an 11 year old and a four year old um, that were raising themselves because their grandparents and older relatives had died in the genocide. Their parents wow. um, had died of AIDS. And so at 11 and, and seven and four, I think there was actually three kids in that house um, that we took, uh, you know, food to them as we were going out and discover, you know, their living conditions. And you can only imagine what they're doing to, to sell themselves to survive. Wow. And um, we brought some candles we had, you know, soap and rice and beans and oil. And I thought, why is, why is the pastor saying we should bring uh, birthday candles? I thought, are we going to bake up a cake? You know, that's strange. Yeah. But actually those kids put those little birthday candles in between those little boards on the table. And that was the only light that they had at night to keep from being scared when they were falling asleep and to see in the dark, to, to find the, the place to go to sleep. And so that light though, they got born again, they've gotten involved in the church there. We went back three years later and saw that they were uh, actively, uh, I don't know if the word is adopted, but fostered into the, the Christian school and church there. So why go around the world? There's poverty next door to you and there's people yeah. who haven't heard, but there's also, so it's not an either or it's both. And so whether you give, go or pray missions is God's heart has been from the book of Genesis all the way through the whole story. So I encourage you to get involved in some way, do your part in the great commission. Amen. Cause you know, I think it comes down to that, you know, like you said it and you know, God has a plan for all of us. Like, you know, our heart is Honduras, you know, your heart is global you know, and maybe someday we may go beyond that, but that's where we're at. So I just think the importance is, is answering that call yes. uh, where God has called you to focus on. But like I feel in my heart, we should have a passion for global missions as well. Uh, there's another gentleman I was talking to that, you know, sometimes we can get into this shell or this box and, and we see America but we don't see beyond the borders, but God's kingdom is not America. God's kingdom is global. God's kingdom is the world. And so, you know, what part can you take in missions? What part can you take in reaching the lost in another area of the world? Because again, there's opportunities that we have as Americans. Like I was going down the road with my pastor friend to San Pedro and, you know, we're limited on even just getting Bibles here locally. It's I'm, I'm like talking to a, a guy before this Zoom call. He's coming across the border. He's bringing material. I'm like, look, if you've got Bibles, I'm ready to buy them right now. Yes. That's the limitation that we have in our community. They don't have books on prayer. They don't have books on faith, you know, things like that. Obviously, we do our best to get that material to them. But on my phone, I, I can get anything I want. You know, I can get a, a book in seconds, but that's not available to people right. around the world. They don't have the level of teaching that we are spoiled on as Americans, as Christian believers, that many of them, many believers don't even want to utilize. They would fall over themselves to get a hold of that type of material. So why missions? Because we need to go take the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need, we need to go take the truth of his word and teach and train the nations and not be 
national minded, but be world minded. Yes. So, that's the part know, of that. You know, I know we're kind of getting off the little topic here, but, but you uh, shared about, uh, you know, uh, about passion, about kids and encountering and not entertaining, but more of an education. And that kind of, you know, I was just sharing that the church in the world needs the truth and they need uh, uh, the truth to be taught. And so if you don't mind, maybe share a little bit about that as far as not necessarily focus on entertainment, but, but uh, teaching and training. Well, yeah, and, and even the encountering, because I think what we've done um, as, as a generation, we have, we used to grow up in Sunday school, where, you know, you had that, those Bible stories being taught, and even for me and my, my parents, my mom and dad, every night before we go to bed, we'd have family devotions, and I'd hear those stories, and, and yet we have kind of gone away from the vacation Bible school, the Sunday schools, the things for discipleship. You're talking about Bibles. I mean, there's churches that I know that the pastor doesn't even have a Bible internationally. And so, you know, there's not that, there's that Christianity that's a mile wide, but an inch deep, you know? And so we need that discipleship that each person that gets born again does get, if you want to use the word educated in Christianity, very much needed. However, the other part is entertainment. And I don't want to say that that's not somewhat important because yes, we do need to engage with kids that are yeah. online and they're, they're, they're inundated by um, excellence in, in pro production. And, you know, we're doing a, a radio program for kids and we're looking to take it into television. And I know we've got to compete with something that's entertainment based. However, the one key between the entertainment, the education, the thing that I think is my, my biggest passion is we've got to get them to encounter God Amen. because you can use all the curriculum that you want. You can teach all the Bible stories that you want, but until they've been in his presence, until they've been healed for themselves, until they've heard his voice, until they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have a changed life. You have a religious person. And that's what we don't need another generation of religiously trained people. We need disciples of Christ. How is a disciple defined? Well, when Jesus called his disciples, what did he say? Become fishers of men. So the true mark of discipleship that we've actually trained them, we've educated them, they've, they've come to church, is that they now know how to go out and share Jesus with others. And that comes from being Acts 1-8. Again, I go back to you shall be yeah. filled with the Holy Spirit and you shall be my witnesses. Not you will go and witness, but you will be my witnesses. Yeah. And that's what they're becoming in the schools as we see them encounter God. And so that's what I believe if you're listening today, maybe you're a Sunday school teacher, maybe you're a parent, a grandparent. Uh, maybe you can volunteer at your, your church's vacation Bible school this year, or maybe you can go on a short-term mission, or maybe God's calling you to move to the mission field. Whatever it is, you have a part to activate kids in this, as we call them, the next generation church. They're actually this generation church, I believe, that God is going to be using uh, and is using around the world to shake the kingdom Amen. for the gospel. And then, you know, like you said, encountering and and. And like you, with your testimony of that uh, young boy, I believe it was a boy that laid hands on the one with the tumor. I mean, in, in, in operation, in operating in the power of God, because, you know, I'm not saying that, that like our church, uh, you know, I've seen kids pray for the sick and things like that, but I'm just saying, why not? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they? You know, why yeah. would we not teach them that? Why would that be something that we would limit them and say, oh, no, you're not you're not ready for that. We could just teach you these stories. You can praise and worship. You can sing for Jesus. But no, the power of God is just not uh, you're not ready for that. You know, yeah. but yeah. you just basically shared a story uh, that kids are ready for it. And that's the importance of, of them encountering the power of God. So that is just absolutely incredible. And, you know, you're sitting here, you know, I know my wife is more, more involved with the kids than I am. I focus more on teaching and training of pastors and leaders and, and, you know, more of adult ministry. Uh, but you're inspiring me because uh, I can't wait to get off the Zoom call and share my, with my wife about what you're sharing uh, because she has the same heart and passion. She wants to get kids involved in services. She wants to get kids involved in prayer and the power of God and the move of God. Uh, what a what a wonderful, inspiring testimonies that you're sharing with us. Well, you know, I'll just share, you know, the scripture, and I don't have the reference handy, but Jesus uh, says, I believe to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep, if you love me, feed my sheep. And, and then he says, if you love me, feed my lambs. And so if you're a pastor who works with or, or a minister who works with adults, that's great, because Jesus did say to do that. 
but you are still a pastor to those little kids. And yeah. so I'd encourage pastors, you know, have those pastors pals where they come to the front and, and, you know, you can, you can say something before they go off to children's church, or, you know, you still have a relationship to pastor and to mentor that next generation because they look up to you and they're looking for that leadership, that spiritual, spiritual mentorship, even of um, when a pastor prioritizes the children if you teach to kids, the adults will get it. If you teach to the adults, you're speaking a different language. I've been to so many crusades and churches where I've seen the gospel go right over the heads of the kids because we're speaking. If you start speaking Spanish to me right now, I'm not going to understand it, but they're speaking a different language. Kids need it said simply without the Christianese, without the big words. Let's make it simple. What does sin mean? What does salvation mean? What, you know, Jesus used real life illustrations that people could understand in his teaching, object lessons, visual aids, things that they could uh, experience. And so that's the way to teach kids, whether you're an adult pastor or a children's pastor, it's always just making it relevant so that they can understand what you're saying. Amen. Now, before we close, because we got just a little bit more time, uh, you were sharing a little bit about the orphan ministry and then also trafficking kids as far as rescuing them and so forth. Can you just uh, touch on that? Yeah. So my mom grew up in an orphanage. And so my heart has always been to help the widows, the orphans. And some of the things that we're seeing are enabling uh, widows to work at the orphanage, which helps both, um, you know, as far as just getting them food and, and discipling them. But there's this movement that has some merits of, of closing down orphanages in order for um, children to be placed into homes. And while I think that's noble and a good cause, generally speaking, you have to realize that some of these kids who are in group home settings are there because they don't have a safe uh, foster care. They don't have a safe um, a group a home from which they've come. Their parents have sold them into um, slavery, into mm -hmm. sex trafficking, because it's acceptable in other countries to do that. And we think, oh, that's, you know, they must just need money so their kids can get education. So let's, you know, just reunite families. And sometimes that's the greatest thing. But there's also this need for uh, orphanages to continue to be uh, supported so that they can become um, that, that place of hope, that place of home for those until they are able to find a forever home so I want to just encourage us as the body of Christ to not forget what Jesus said, to right. remember the widows and orphans, because that is true religion. And so right now, that's kind of what we're doing is kind of forming a network of orphanages around the world um, to be able to support them in best practices in child care, but most of all in spiritual development and discipleship of those kids, too. Yeah. I mean, I obviously here in Honduras, I've come in contact with many ministries that are involved uh, with orphanages and um, we, we do aquaponics. Um, I teach and train aquaponics and there was a missionary, uh, that asked us to install an aquaponic system there. And it was an orphanage basically for 60 kids. And, um, you know, I've had people say, you know, orphanages are irrelevant now, you know, or that's just kind of, a I I don't even know how to say it, but it's just kind of a, a ministry that anybody, Hey, I'm going to be a missionary. Oh, I'm going to open up an orphanage. Well, one, if you have a heart to open up an orphanage, I, God bless you, because it definitely takes a special heart to do that. This couple that runs this ministry um, is is absolutely amazing couple, because obviously it takes immense amount of patience. But the stories that he would share would literally rip your heart out. Again, yeah. it's just, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to beat on this and beat on this drum, but I just think Americans are so... I don't want to say blindy because I don't want to I, I don't want to say something in, you know, uh, in, in a disparaging way. But Americans don't many don't know what goes on in this world. And mm -hmm. if they truly knew what went on in this world, they would be shocked. And, and it's just it's crazy what these kids go through uh, here in Honduras and how the, uh, they'll take them off the streets and bring them to this orphanage and beg them, please take them, even though they're at capacity, well over capacity, but they take them because they know that if they don't, they'll go right back to the streets, going back to their horrible, horrible lives. And it's sad that we would even have to imagine that kids are going through what they go through. You know, I've been to Tuguzi or San Pedro Sula and you know, you're a stoplight and there's like a, a eight year old little boy carrying, you know, his baby brother and begging for money. And yeah. you're like, where's their parents? Many times they don't have parents. They're living on the street. And this eight little year old little boy is taking care of their infant child. You know, I mean, it's just 
there's countless stories. And so, yes, I mean, orphanages, well-run, Christian-based, you know, mm -hmm. Holy Ghost-filled, Jesus-filled yes. orphanages, because I've seen many uh, adults, met many adults that says, I came out of an orphanage, and there are pillars in the yeah. local church. There are men and women of God because they were raised up in orphanage. So I believe in my heart, orphanages are definitely needed. Wow. But as far as like trafficking, you know, I know that the gentleman that I talked to at the other uh, missionary, we couldn't disclose his location. He talked about actually saving, you know, yeah. individuals from trafficking. And that was one of his focuses on his ministry. So mm -hmm. yeah, these heartbreaking we, stories. Yeah, no, we, we were in Peru once and, and you saw those kids that were, um, they would burn their ear or their nose or chop off an arm or whatever they needed to do to make them more money as beggars. Uh, and we went into one village where the uh, you could see even like four or five year old kids that were being abused in this wild west like town where even the police wouldn't go. And we worked with a combination of um, uh, American resources for law enforcement, let's just leave it at that, to come in and to actually put a stop for uh, those kids that were being trafficked. And then we worked with the local ministry to help those those moms and those kids uh, or sometimes just the kids to really get into a safe place and, and to be discipled for Christ, because it it is about, yes, saving the millions around the world, but it's also about that one child. What are you going to do yeah. if you know that one child? What if that one child was your child? Yeah. So, you know, for anybody that's listening right now, I just I just want to encourage you to just pray the Lord and just, just say, God, help me see what mm -hmm. they're sharing here. Help me see what you want me to do and what part you want me to play. Because, you know, again, I share, I didn't have any interest in missions before I heard the word Honduras, you know, I had no interest. I went to Mexico with our church, didn't have any interest at all, other than, you know, obviously I went there to help and, you know, I was glad to help, but I'm just saying it wasn't a passion of mine. But once I truly started, you know, partaking in missions, going on the mission field, and then getting the call of God on my life to go into missions, uh, I mean, it will definitely change your worldview and it will change, it will change your way that you look at life in many cases. And, you know, I guarantee that if God uh, has a plan and you just simply say, Lord, show me what part do you want me to take in missions? I promise you, he's going to show you. Yeah, let me let me just close with one thing. You know, give, go and pray. It's not an either or. I encourage right. everybody do all of it. Be a part of missions that God has for you around the world and next door. Let's keep going into all the world and reaching the, the boys and girls and the adults for Jesus. If you want to learn more about us, we're at fofgm.com. It stands for Family of Faith Global Missions.com. Thank you so much, brother. I look forward to meeting you one day in person, Lord willing. Come to Amen. Florida. We'll have to come visit you there sometime. And I just encourage everybody listening, get behind this man of God and the ministry they're doing there because it is life changing for the boys and girls and for the adults they're reaching. It matters. Amen. And you matter in missions. Yep. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.